Welcome back to this already, the final segment of The Price of Business. I'm your host, Kevin Price, talking to you about you and your business. Got Steve Stockman, the congressman from uh, the Houston area, uh, also a candidate for the United States Senate here in Texas, as a guest on our program. Earlier this week, a couple days ago, during the State of the Union address, he uh, got out in the middle of the president's speech, as he told the American people, that he planned on, uh, planned on as much as humanly possible to suspend rule of law and to uh, operate by edict, which brought rousing applause by uh, Democrats, but uh, obviously a great deal of angst by conservatives. Steve, welcome to the program as always. Thank you all, great ones. Good talking to you. Thank you for taking my call. Oh, uh, I appreciate you calling and, and being a part of our, our conversation, as always. We're always looking for you as well. Tell me, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, did you have an intention going in there to walk out uh, if this kind of language was used? And by the way, specifically, the president said, whenever I can uh, avoid legislative requirements, I'm going to, I'm going to make law happen, is, what, is basically a paraphrase of what he said, which, uh, you know, to me, just showed incredible pride and arrogance and a disregard of rule of law, a, su- a superiority in himself, that somehow he is somehow smarter than the collective body of Congress and, and uh, the uh, wisdom of the fo- you know founding fathers. But did you have a plan and intention to go out if that kind of language came up, or, or how did that happen? Well, what happened is that some of his text apparently was uh, being released prior to his, uh, his speech, and... Um, I was talking with others, and I thought, if this really is the case in which he's going to go forward with this public announcement that he's going to bypass Congress, I said, I think we need to do more than just uh, uh, sit there and listen through the rest of the speech. And I didn't want to shout out anything because that probably wasn't a good avenue. But I thought if he did go forward with this uh, unprecedented power grab, I'd get up and walk out, and that's exactly uh, what we did. I did, rather. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, I noticed that everyone gets paired up with different people. Uh, Who are you paired up with? Well, this is funny because, as you know, we brought Ted Nugent in last year, and and we were actually, as far as I know, we were one of the first members to start bringing uh, people in of of fame. And now uh, we had quite a few last night, Uh, everyone from Benghazi, uh, and then, of course, uh, Sean uh, Hennedy was there, and and, um, also... uh, some other well, we brought. I need to bring Kevin Price next year. Yeah, but, that uh, would be awesome if you did that. I, that'd be pretty cool, dude. But uh, yeah, the thing I brought, which kind of made the point extra back when we first invited him, was th- this guy who lied about Obamacare that he signed up and it was easy and it was cheaper. It turned out it was all fabricated. So we thought in order to highlight the the fallacy of Obamacare and the fallacy of of you know, the unicorn's paying for it. You remember, it's all going to be free, and everybody's going to, uh, no one's going to have to pay for it. And this kid uh, was a liar, and we thought it was appropriate that we highlight that, and we invited him, and we got quite a bit of a stir when we first invited him. But he actually showed up, and uh, the president did not recognize him like he did uh, the the military uh, hero that was sitting uh, next to the first lady. Yeah, but I, I'm also noticing that uh, for for the kumbaya effect, that they have members of different parties sitting next to each other, you know, and you kind of get partnered with each other on that. So, who did you end up sitting by? Well, we we uh, there were well, there were several I, people probably don't know this, but there's there's not a lot of seats uh, available when you start adding the Senate. And and by the way, the the, the they're not always sitting. They're pretty much Republicans. If you're looking. Uh, from the president's standpoint, Republicans are sitting on the left and Democrats are sitting on the right. Right. And they try to get us to mingle. They, d- they did a little bit of that. The Democrats primarily want to save their seats along the middle. You know, Sheila Jackson leaves uh, there hours before the speech and, and other members will put their belongings there. But primarily, Republicans are on the left. And I was standing and sitting with some of the members of uh, my caucus, Republican caucus, and uh, we were actually in the back. Uh, we we don't always get seats. That's probably kind of surprising to uh, a lot of people. But we were squeezed in the back. Yeah, very interesting. Interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I, I probably they want you as far to the back as humanly possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, what is your what's your thoughts? You know, what was your sentiment? What were what was the Democrats' response to? Um, you know. What would you call it? Policy by edict. 
uh, when Obama said that. What was your thoughts about well, that? Well, it cheered. It was ironic because I thought it reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, it's ironic they would cheer that. That's alarming. It, remember, this is the president who spied on our allies, uh, Jeremy Chancellor Merkel, who spied on, um, uh, quite frankly, the, the Washington press corps, which is surprising they don't care about that. He's uh, got the RS files that were brought to his office. Uh, a lot of the conservative groups have applied for 501c4 status, have been blocked. Uh, this is a president who feels he has no limits to his power. And unfortunately, uh, we don't have leadership uh, that, that challenges that. But I'm looking forward to maybe uh, changing that uh, way, way everybody's perception is. And I would really like to see uh, some kind of either... Uh, I don't know, some, some kind of measure to, to signify our displeasure with what he's doing. Yeah. What's, what are your House colleagues doing about this? I, I'm so incredibly disappointed with Daryl Issa, you know, who, who did a pretty good job of belly aching for a while. But, you know, I get tired of being told that there's not enough, enough votes in the Senate to, to do anything about impeachment. That doesn't seem like that is grounds for uh, the House uh, failing to do what it needs to do. I tend to agree with you. I think that... Uh, you can at least send a signal that the House is displeased with uh, with the way that the executive orders are carrying out. And, of course, now the left says, well, you know, Reagan has done more executive orders than, than Obama. And that may be true. I haven't checked that. Uh, probably a good idea to check it because a lot of times our facts aren't right. But this president has used executive orders in a way that no other president had, which is to actually legislate, which is against the Constitution. And... Uh, I, I'm just concerned that this kind of behavior going forward in the next three years is a lame duck. He's going to get more and more frustrated and use uh, uh, what his perceived powers are against the uh, you know, the United States. He also chooses, chooses what laws to endorse. And I mean, if you look at even his own bill, Obamacare, he's, he's picking winners and losers. And uh, I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if that's I – mean, it's codified law. I don't know if you can say which laws you should endorse. Same thing with the uh, the Marriage Act. He decided not to uh, to defend it, and that was a law of the land. So it's kind of unusual to have a president just unilaterally pick and choose which things he wants to support. It's really quite incredible. How important is the 2014 election? You're, of course, a player in that. Uh, we have a Republican. Uh, I call a Republican in name only with John Cornyn a man who essentially voted for Obamacare by throwing one of the most courageous members of the Senate under the the bus in Ted Cruz, uh, a man who voted for TARP and said in an interview immediately after that that uh, you know, about six months after we saw how big of a disaster TARP was, actually. He said, well, the best minds in the country told me I'd had to do this or our country would be ruined. Well, guess what? None of those so-called best minds swore to defend the Constitution. John Cornyn has sworn to do just that. And so uh, when I look at how great of a state the, the state of Texas is, it's shocking that we have such representation. So uh, we need a real conservative, which is why uh, I'm excited about your race. But how important is the U.S. Senate races all, all around the country? Yeah, it, it's interesting. He says, A, I'm not a threat, and B, he can stand on his record. Yet if you look at the advertising, it's not talking about his record. It's talking and attacking me personally, which I can explain. I can tell you on this show, it's the first time I'm going to mention it, we're actually going to bring suit against the uh, the, the individuals that are running those ads because they, no, they don't have any legs to stand on. There's no evidence for some of their accusations. But this is how desperate he is. He's telling everybody, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I have nothing to care about. The Houston Chronicle said that uh, the corn is going to brush me off like a fly. Yet you're spending millions of dollars uh, going after me and yet not not really articulating uh, why you should be reelected? Yeah, uh, this is typical of the left, by the way. It's, it's the typical. That, yeah, it's absolutely, yeah. Uh, absolutely true. And it was interesting, even before they knew who they were going to target. And believe me, they're spending all their money on Steve Stockman. They don't consider anyone else to be a threat uh, of the slot. And so, I, I, of the list, I encourage anyone thinking of supporting anyone other than Steve Stockman to put that in consideration in your vote because they know who the threat is. But it was interesting, even before they recognized you as the one who was going to run, they spent millions of dollars on a campaign, uh, just, just a generic campaign on why John Cornyn should be reelected. And it's like, oh, I see John Cornyn is running against himself. That's interesting. 
Yeah, I, I actually, if someone says, well, I believe those commercials against you that you're a, you know, well, the way they describe me as an international drug smuggler or something, I don't know. But <laughs> if you believe those commercials, then I would recommend you do ABC, anybody but corn. And there's eight people running. I don't care if you don't vote for me, definitely don't vote for John, because you're going to get the same melt toast uh weak leadership from him that you've gotten in the last 12 years. You're not going to see anything br- uh, bright spot in the future. Oh, yeah. We got about six months to maybe nine months of, of better leadership out of Cornyn because he was scared to death, you know, and he saw what happened with Ted Cruz. It didn't last very long, and it's going to be business as usual uh, once he uh, once uh, he ends up uh, getting the nomination, if he gets the nomination, which I, you know, people are saying, oh, he's going to get it, oh, he's going to get it. I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of people out there who are going to vote against Cornyn. They're not going to care who's on it. They're going to vote against Cornyn. That means that he doesn't get 50% plus one. If that happens, that means who's ever in second place is going to be in a runoff with him, which I think is going to be Steve Stockman. When that happens, I think for every one corner supporter that uh, has the tenacity to get out of bed and vote on Election Day, there's going to be uh, two or three Tea Partiers who are going to make a difference. I think Cornyn is very vulnerable. I think he's vulnerable to Steve Stockman. Well, I, I can tell you this, that if he didn't think I was a threat, he wouldn't. would you spend millions of dollars against me? Uh, no, the answer is really... Uh, up front in that his actions tell you what he thinks is a you know is, is a threat to him. Cornyn is scared, and he has every reason to be. See, Stockman, he's running for U.S. Senate, old friend of mine, a great friend of this program, uh, Stockman2014.com, Stockman2014.com. I love that very warm Kodak moment photos, series of them, of uh, John Cornyn and his good friend Barack Obama. Uh, a guy that he admires and loves so much that he would throw Ted Cruz, our U.S. Senator, under the bus to accommodate. Uh, it's just warm and fuzzy. I got I got chills up and down my spine when I saw that photo of Cornyn and Obama. And so thanks for sharing yeah, Chris, that. See that Chris more. Matthews, Go ahead. Chris Matthews said, hey, you know, he says, we don't need another Ted Cruz in the office. And he's referring to me. So. Yeah, absolutely right. Stop in 2014.com. Check it out. My friend, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, and thank you again for taking my call. You bet. When we come back, uh, we'll be glad to uh, chat with you more about what's happening on the front out there in business and politics tomorrow when we're with you. But between now and then, make sure you check us out at usdailyreview.com while they're liking on Facebook. Follow it on Twitter.